Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today I have some really fun techniques to share with you and we are gonna make some adorable cards. And here are some examples I've already finished. Um, you can see I've got these little monsters kind of peeking out from this torn paper area. And I'm gonna show you how to get that effect with a technique called masking. We're also gonna make some cute coordinating envelopes. It's a great way to use up those stacks of paper that you might have uh, lying around. And this technique is so fun, I bet you will make a stack of cards just like I have here. And and uh, the envelope technique, you don't need a template. It's super easy. All you need is a pair of scissors and a ruler, really, and uh, you can totally make it happen. And what I also really like is when you do use a masking technique, you get to give your cards um, a totally unique look. So this is the little critter stamps that I'm using. This is from a company called Quetzalcraft, and I found them at topflightstamps.com. They're our sponsor today, and what I love about Top Flight is they scour the globe looking for the cutest stamps you can't easily find in America, and they put them in one place for us to uh, for us to grab and um, I'm using this torn paper stamp and there's actually two stamps here one's still in the package the other one is on my block because we are going to use it um, and the great thing about this is that you can combine this with whatever else you have for stamps think about that with like these cute little dogs to get them poking through the little frame or these little uh, sassy cats wouldn't they be adorable and I'll link those products below so you can find them we're going to do some uh, water-based marker coloring we're going to use some distress oxide and we're just going to have a great time so the first thing you're going to want to do is cut a piece of watercolor paper um, about the size that you want, maybe a little bit bigger so you'll have room to trim. And this is a watercolor paper that I've used for all of these cards. It's by Arteza, and I like it that it is... Um, it is textured on one side and smooth on the other, and you're gonna use the smooth side. You can also use any uh, nice quality cardstock that works well with water-based mediums for this. Watercolor paper just gives you a little bit more of, um, uh, gives you a little more working time, makes the markers easier to blend, and um, it's just, it'll just make the project go a little bit easier for you. But of course, use whatever you have. Oh, and I'm gonna have a coupon code in the video description so you can save 10% off your order over at Top Flight Stamps. So uh, you'll want make sure you use that if you're gonna do your order. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just stamp this right in the middle of my paper and I'm doing it in the middle because I do plan on doing some die cutting. If you look at these um, these examples I have kind of like a little pierced die cut edge and uh, I thought that would be kind of fun to use. Of course you can use whatever you want to cut your paper out. And there we've got a really nice impression. And then what you're going to do while you've got your stamp inky is you're gonna make a mask. And so to do that, you wanna get a post-it note. And I like to uh, find these big ones if I can. These were actually a sample. I don't even know where I got them. I think they were in like a, a goodie bag in a meeting or something. And what you wanna do is stamp your image kind of close to the sticky part so that you can, when you cut it out, you're gonna have some sticky on it. It's gonna hold it onto your um, onto your paper. Now you're gonna to wanna to do that twice and you're gonna to wanna to cut some masks out. So the way I cut this out, and I'm not gonna cut it again because I've already done it, and you can save these and reuse them, is you're gonna cut one out that is just the innards. So you're gonna cut one so you save the outside one. And when you stamp that, you wanna stamp that more in the middle of the post-it note. And then you're gonna stamp another one and you're gonna cut out the um, you're gonna cut out the center and the torn paper part. So all that you have left, all that um, you know, you're gonna cut out so that when you stick that down over your image, it's just the background that's gonna be that's gonna be visible. So I, I'll actually cut this one out just because. Um, this is still perfectly fine to use. It's just so inked up from my last batch of cards that it might be difficult for you to see. So you just want to go through, and you want to cut out we're going to be keeping the open area and all of these curls everything else we want to cut away because that is going to be how we do our background this is going to protect our um our stamping area and our curled area and this will take a couple minutes to do so i'm not going to do it all on camera but just try to be careful to you know cut it fairly accurately all right, here you see the masks cut out, and you're probably thinking, why would you stamp it twice and cut it out twice? Because you have an innie and an Audi, but you have to because on the um, the frame part, you are um, you are only cutting out this opening in here. You are masking off the curls, and on the inside part, you're also masking out the curls. So you do need to stamp it twice, and plus you kind of destroy the background when you were cutting this this part out anyway. So what we're going to do is we are going to take the frame part of the mask, and we are going to carefully place it over our um, over our stamped area. So you might need to uh, wiggle it around a bit to figure out exactly how it lines up. 
there we go and I'm going to turn this around here now sometimes you're you know you might have stamped it on a little wonky or differently than how you stamped your mask and what you want to do in that case is just grab another post-it note and again you can keep reusing these and put that anywhere you think you might you know hit that background of your card then you're going to take whatever critter or animal you want to use and you're going to ink that up and I just thought this guy was pretty cute so uh, he's the one I decided to do Just make sure you got it good and inked and then you're just going to stamp him somewhere in the frame then you can put him sideways it doesn't really matter just try to make sure that his face is going to be shown through the frame and i'll show you two different versions with this stamp too because depending on how much of him you have peeking out you're going to get a different look i think he's so cute kind of peeking over from the side i've got two with him like this one is just with the eyeballs and i thought that was really cute and then this one here has more of his torso in there and he just looks, he looks a little more grumpy because you can see the teeth on that one so i mean it really gives your stamps a lot of versatility and then we're just going to set that aside and look how he magically appears in the frame there we are going to use some watercolor pens here and these are a real brush pen meaning they have little their bristles rather than a fiber tip or a felt tip pen but you can use whichever kind you like we're also going to want a water brush here um, and that's just you can also use a cup of water and a paintbrush but the water brush makes it a little easier because you've got a constant feed of water when you need it also have a paper towel handy so you can blot your brush if you need to so you don't get too much water so we're going to start off by doing the background and I decided that a shade of bluish teal color would look pretty so these are pens are by Arteza by the way you can use whatever brand you want anything water based is going to be fine and if you're new I recommend that you work um, in a, kind of a small area at a time now if you're like me here and you've got your background kind of broken up into three areas because of the antenna that's a really great place to um, to begin I stamped with a waterproof ink I used Ranger Archival that way I know that when I blend with my um, with my water brush it's not going to loosen up the um, the stamping ink if you want to be extra safe it's a good idea to heat set it um, hopefully mine doesn't bleed Hopefully it's dried enough, but we will see in a second, won't we? Okay, so now I am just going to grab my brush here. I like to get it started on a paper towel, so I just give it a little squeeze on a paper towel, and then I am just going to blend it in. And again, this will work with whatever water-based markers you have, whether they're, you know, dual tip Tombos or Crayolas. Um, it doesn't really matter. It will work with any water-based um, water pen. If you want to go back in while this was wet though and add more color that that only really works well with the with the real brush pens because the felt tip pens like to kind of soak up the water on the surface rather than laying down color so that gives you a nice blend there um, and i'll show you that technique about adding the water first so if i want to go in here uh, and, I'm, and you have the real brush pens you can go in you can wet this whole area even and you're not getting it sopping wet because this is um, uh, this is not a cotton watercolor paper. It's a very inexpensive watercolor paper. I wouldn't want to go too crazy with it. Then you can go in with your pens and see it's still spitting out color. It's not soaking up the water from the paper, which a felt tip pen would do. So I would only use this technique if you've got the real brush pens or if you're using watercolors. Really, you could use watercolors for this, the fine tip brush and then you have a little bit more open time so that's what the advantage to this would be it just gives you a little bit more time to blend because your ink doesn't dry so quickly and um, this does work better on watercolor paper but if cardstock's all you got then it'll work fine it just might not blend as easily but it should still work just fine and then you've got a, just a little bit more time to blend because that ink hasn't like dried on the paper yet now these pens happen to be reactive with water so um, if we were to drop some water on it later and it landed in any place that we co colored with the pens we could get some little water marks which could look really cool and artistic but it also might not be what you want so if you absolutely want to make sure that no water will affect what you're doing in the future you could always stamp this on a um, paper that's more you know appropriate for alcohol pens and color it with alcohol pens and then it would be completely permanent if any water hit it and there there's how we do our little background uh, now we're going to work on the um, the little monster I am going to heat dry it really quickly though because um, uh, if I paint this area and the background still wet then my color could fade could kind of feather off into the background and I don't want that effect 
that should do it. It doesn't take very long. I'm going to use two different shades of green and a shade of kind of like a lemon yellow. And I'm going to start with my darkest green and I am going to kind of do the edges here. And remember he is kind of behind these little tears in the paper so you got to make sure you bring that color all the way. I'll just start with the bottom part of his body first because it's always easier to blend in a small area. So I got my darkest at the edges. Then I'm going to overlap with this medium green. It's kind of a, like a lime green. And see how it blends that color in. That's the same way I would color with alcohol pens too. And then I'm going to go in with my yellow. And if you're using a felt tip marker, you might want to use like a water brush and like scribble your marker off on um, on a, like a piece of plastic and then pick it up with a water brush because you could uh, muddy a felt tip marker pen but with a real brush pens uh, it doesn't really work. If you have a problem you can always just wipe it on a paper towel and any of that ink will transfer off on the paper towel and then you get a really pretty blend there and I feel like that gives you a lot of really nice dimension and I'm just gonna go in with this that darker color and put his hand in there. And if you did see that like your ink skipped anywhere when you're all done you can go in and you can um, you know connect those lines you can you know just use a permanent fine tip pen and, and adjust anything like that when you're done like there I didn't I must have had like a little a little gap where I stuck my mask down because I can see I the teeth didn't go that line didn't go all the way around if it bothers me later I can fill it in I don't think it's gonna bother me quite frankly I think it's gonna be just fine and again, we're going to go in with our medium green, overlap, spread that color out a little bit. These are really easy to work with. Just want to make sure you have a nice smooth paper. Bristol works really well for this, hot press watercolor paper. I don't get like arches for this because I think it's too much of an, of an expense and I don't really think you see much of a benefit going with a really expensive watercolor paper on a project like this because you're not soaking it and scrubbing it and doing those techniques that you know you would buy that watercolor paper for. I think finding a you know reliable inexpensive paper like this Arteza is, um, is really really fits the bill in this case. Now um, I think I want to do those little spots in yellow and um, I think I'm going to go ahead and work on these little paper curls while I have these markers out. I am going to use kind of like a darker yellow color. Now if I do like get into that green, um, chances are I'm going to smudge it into this yellow. So just be careful as you're going around the, um, the edges here not to drag in any of that color. Or you could make sure your background is fairly coordinating or close but it's it's not that difficult and it's it's a card you know what if you get a little smudge of ink it's not the end of the world so what I'm doing here I'm just putting the color in pretty much in the shadowy areas and then I can go in with a lighter yellow and give it a little kind of like overlap it a little bit for our blending color so easy I love how these blend it's so fun as you can see, I made that stack of cards yesterday because I was having so much fun <laughs> with these that it's like, oh my gosh, I need to actually stop and make a video here because I'm just having too much fun playing. And then, since I'm going to be switching colors, I was using green, I'm taking my paper towel, I'm just going to squeeze my water brush out, make sure that, that no more color comes out. By the way, this is a flat water brush. I find that when I am trying to blend like color pencil or marker, having a flat, a small flat works a little bit better than a round for whatever reason. I just think it it is a little firmer and it pushes the pigment around a little bit more so uh, if you like to work with watercolor pencils, watercolor markers, watercolor crayons I think that you would um, for for detail try one of the tiny flat ones I know um, Prima makes them, Arteza makes them I'll link up some options in the video description so you can find them um, they just have a little bit more firmness and it just helps blend those colors I think and I'm not using very much water at all. You don't want to be soaking your paper here. I just want to fill in kind of the white or at least blend it to white in some of these areas. Now I'm going to be doing some Distress Oxide inking on the background and um, 
I want to make sure there's going to be some sort of shadow around my um, my paper curls. So I'm actually going in with this. Uh, it's kind of like a coral color, like a muted coral. And I am just going in and adding a little bit of shadow. Oops, be more careful than I am. I just went over that paper curl. Uh, basically, I want to put a little bit of shadow under here. And also what this is going to do is if I don't stick my mat, my uh, mask down perfectly, or maybe I didn't cut my mask perfectly, this is going to... Um, this is going to keep me from getting like a white halo because, hey, well, you know, sometimes you just don't stick your mask down right or you didn't cut it just right or this is just going to save you a little aggravation. So just go around and add that anywhere you see like those shadows, those, those sketched in shadows on your stamp. That's really helpful because it kind of gives you a little bit of a guidance if you're not, um, you know, if you not, are not that, you know, used to coloring or shading, that just helps you along a little bit. So after you have your shading in, this is what it looks like. I know it's not very pretty, but we're just going to go in with our brush. Uh, just is just clean water and we're going to soften the edges. Um, don't worry, it does not have to be perfect. It's just giving us a little bit of shadow so that when we do our oxide inking over it, um, that it's a little bit darker under those curls of paper. This should not be perfect. I mean, if it comes out perfect, then good for you. That's awesome. But, um, but it's going to be kind of sloppy. And that's where this flat brush kind of comes in handy because it's a little bit firmer. If you're using a brush from your stash, just pick one that's like a golden or white tacklon brush that's a small flat, like quarter inch flat or smaller, and that will help you break up that pigment on your paper and drag it out. When you, your round brushes are better for moving around um, uh, more liquid or loose pigments, like if you're using ink on a palette or something like that, round brush would be great for that. But when you want to remove your um, your pigment and spread it around, a flat brush does work a little bit better just because of the firmness of the bristles. Okay, so while that's drying, and it's important that dries before you do your background inking, we are going to um, work a little bit more on the face. Um, I'm using a couple glaze pens. What these are, they're a gel pen and they have, um, they have like a, they almost give you like an embossed look, give you a really glossy raised look. And so I like to go in and color like some of the yellow spots with that. I'm going to do the, um, this is actually an opaque gel pen called a Moonlight, which you think if it was called Moonlight, it would be like, um, You'd think it would be like sparkly, but it's not. It's just kind of like a nice opaque neon orange, which I think is a great monster eyeball color. And, you know, chances are you've got some gel pens in your stash. Maybe you got them for the kids to play with, or maybe you had them for, you know, office supplies or coloring books or what have you. They are wonderful to use in this um in this manner. And I'm going to grab, um, I think I'm actually going to do a blue or purple or something in the eyeballs. Why not some purple? That might be kind of interesting looking. It's fun to grab colors you don't expect. And since I use that one place, I think I'll also use it in the little antenna. So it has kind of another place to, uh, to kind of pull from. And if you want to put some like bright highlights, I would hit this really quick with the heat tool. And then you can do some like some uh, highlights in the eyes. And if you got like maybe a mistake in the teeth or something and you colored too far and you could clean up those um, those spots. So you do want to make sure that this is dry before you go on to the next step. So go ahead and give that a nice dry. Otherwise, um, that gel pen will act almost like a glue and will stick to your mask. If I tip this to the light, I think you can probably see the, the shininess of those little spots. It's a tiny little detail, but I think it's fun nonetheless. So now what you want to do is grab a piece of scrap paper. Um, this is a stamping mat, which is great if your table is not perfectly um, even because it gives you a little bit of squish. And um, I don't want to get ink on that because ink will not dry on this foam surface. So I want to protect that. And then I'm going to stick the mask down over. And that's why we covered up, that's why we cut out a mask that also had the, um, the paper curls in there because we want to make sure that that is protected as well. And if you want, if you can use like a little bit of glue stick or something to tack that down. 
see if I have one handy. If you're worried that it's going to move on you, um, you can just kind of give it a little bit on there or use a little quilter's basting spray. If you've already colored it and you're not going back in, it should be fine to do it that way. They used to make a post-it note glue stick, but I don't think they have that anymore, unfortunately. So you just want to make sure you have it lined up as well as you can. It's okay if it's a little bit tinier than what you have on your paper because um, it's never going to like match up exactly when you put your ink. Your ink will skip a little bit, so that just avoids a halo. So that's going to be fine. So I'm going to use a couple shades of Distress Oxide ink, and this is a lot of fun for backgrounds because it blends really well. And I'm just going to use one applicator, and I'm finally getting the hang of using the store-bought applicators after using my homemade ones for so long. I don't have many of them, um, so uh, but I do for a few colors. So I'm going to start off with this uh, Abandoned Coral, which is kind of like an orangey red. And it's really important that you dry your background. Like if, if that was still wet from blending, you'd have a really hard edge. And it would be really tough to overcome that. And you don't have to use any fancy blending techniques. I basically just want to pull out from that, that center mask so that um, I don't have any gaps. Bring out that nice red color. So that will give me a little bit more of a shadow. In closer to the torn paper because if it was paper torn out it would cast a shadow and I'll even just kind of stamp off my tool a little bit and then I'm going to grab some of the orange and just kind of overlap it a little bit we're just we're just putting a coating of, of uh, ink down you don't need to do any fancy techniques and I don't do the circles around the mask because it will probably lift up the edges of my mask and get underneath there if you had like a masking paper um, then you know that would be stuck down tight but uh, that's a little rich for my blood, and especially since it's not really necessary. I don't, um, I don't have any of that. I just use the, I use my cheap free post-it notes that come in, you know, you know, free goodie bags. Okay, then if you want to do a little bit on the edge, you can. Now, I will warn you that this stuff is very slow to dry, so if you get some on your fingers, chances are you're going to smudge it where you don't want it. Uh, I have an envelope over there that's got a smudge on it because I didn't realize my fingers still had some on there. Um, once it dries, it should be pretty permanent for you, but until then, it can uh, be a little bit of a pain. So something else you might want to do, and you can do this with any background stamp. I've got this. Um, this is actually Clouds from Quetzalcraft, which would be really pretty as like a in like a... A, like a stamp scape type thing or a scene. Um, I'm actually gonna use that to put some texture on. If you get a stamp like this, I recommend that if it has an orientation that you take like a marker and put like an arrow on the back of it because it can be really tricky to figure out what, um, you know, what way is up when you're working. I'm just gonna use this for some texture here. So I'm just inking it up in the darker of the two colors. You could use any sort of pattern stamp for this really. And I'm just gonna stamp that a couple times. It's not really gonna show up that much, but it's just gonna give me a little bit of texture. Now with these Distress Oxide inks or any Distress ink, you could actually stamp it, ink it up in just um, water and get some interesting textures that way. So this is actually, I'm going for like an old brick wall look and this is gonna give me that look here. So before I do anything else to this, I am going to heat set this ink because you can see how glossy it is like, it's just sitting on top of the paper here. It's not soaking in. So I'm just gonna heat set this and then we'll come back to do our next step. Okay, that's pretty well dry, but I want to give it some really cool texture. So what I'm going to do is spray, and you could, or you could splatter with like a paintbrush, but I feel like I have a little more control with the sprayer. I'm just going to spray on some water. I'm going to try to avoid the mask, but I left it on just in case, in case I got some on the focal point area. And just let it sit for a second, and then you want to blot up, and look at the cool texture you get there. So you've got this like double time texture. You've got the, um, you've got the rich color that you applied with a blender, you have got the um, color, the texture that you stamped on, and then you've got this beautiful texture from uh, spraying some water. Now I could see I didn't trim my stamp very closely, and I've got a little bit of a ridge there from like the edge of my stamp, so I'm going to hit that with a little bit of water to kind of break that up. And you can do it, you can do several layers of this, um, of this uh, spattering. You know, do, do as much as you like, or as little as you like, or don't do it at all. It's completely up to, do, to you. I will say that um, when you do do the water here, it does seem to help the ink absorb into the paper a little bit, so it does um, it does seem to lock it a little bit better. Okay, so now let's peel off our mask and see what we have. 
Isn't that cute? Oh, I just love it. Okay, you do want to heat this one more time and just make sure that you've got it all dry so that you don't uh, smear it with your fingers. Excuse the mess of my table. We are going to die cut this out and I thought I would show you because it's a technique I haven't shown you before. We are going to use a um, a cutting and piercing die and these have been pretty popular and uh, they come in sets where you've got like a die that cuts the frame. See how it's got like a straight blade there and then you've got a die that either cuts a stitching mark or cuts a piercing line. These are by Spellbinders um, but there are different companies that make them and um, this is how I use them. There might be a couple different ways to use them. Um, I've done some with circles and squares. I thought I'd do this one with a circle because the other one I did here I did with a square just for a different look. So the first thing you want to do is, or the first thing I do, then this works really well for me, is I put down the, uh, the outer frame first, like that. And then I'm just going to run that through my machine. One time should do it. And this, like, you can't get this color anymore. This is like a 10 years or more old Big Shot. It's like the first one that came out from Ellison and it is still going strong. So I like to keep using this old one so people can see like, take care of your stuff, it will last you. And that would be fine. You can run it, you can keep it just like that. But if you wanna have that uh, trendy stitched line, you just set that back down on your machine. Now, depending if you want your stitches to be poking down or poking up, um, you would just, if you want it poking down, you would flip that like that and do it like that. Or if you want the stitches to be poking down, you go this way. If you want the stitches to be poking kind of up through the paper, you go the other way. But I find this really easy to kind of line it up and make sure that I have a good border there. You can see that I've got about a sixteenth of an inch all the way around. The plate that I'm using has magnets in it and that does help everything kind of stay put a little bit better. But you can use a little piece of washi tape to um, keep those together if you're afraid it might slip when it goes through the machine. So all this is going to do is just impart a little bit of um, like texture. It's just going to give you this little line. And see, it just gives you that little sewing line. You could trace that with a pen and make it look um, stitched if you want to, but I'm just going to leave it like that because I think simple works good with cards like this that are so, they have so much color going on anyway. And another tip is um, where I usually die cut is over on the other side of my room and I have a bowl, a magnetic bowl from Harbor Freight that I just drop all my dies into while I'm working so I don't lose anything. Now you're going to have leftover pieces. Now uh, this is a great way you can um, repurpose this. You can die cut small small tags or banners or things and you'll see some examples in just a second of what I did um, and then you can stamp on like happy birthday or thank you or whatever so save these bits die cut them into banners or just hand cut them into banners or little circles or punch shapes or something and then you can use this gorgeous paper that you've just made because why waste it it's gorgeous and here are some examples of ones that I have, you know, previously cut and stamped. So you don't, you know, you don't have to be perfect. It just is great to have these on hand so that you can embellish your cards with them. And, you know, anytime you see a little die like that, that perfect, it's a perfect way to get more use out of the other dies you have. Now, I couldn't pick who, what paper to use, so I thought, well, I'm going to use both of them and I am going to um, just layer them up. So you might be thinking, Lindsay, that's really wasting a lot of that paper. Well, here's what you do. You can go and use your die. You can die cut that out save that scrap for another card and nobody's going to know that you don't have two full sheets of paper there. See? Waste not, want not, and this is ready for another card. Alright, so I am just going to use my adhesive runner here and I get a lot of questions about this. This is an ATG uh, adhesive advanced tape glider and what I do is I actually get um, generic refills for it so it's quite affordable. Uh, so if you thought that this is just kind of a, an expensive um, glue runner. It really isn't if you look at kind of the long term, what you pay long term for it. Um, I think I pay about a dollar twenty-five a roll of the adhesive because I because I get it um, from Tape Depot. I'm not affiliated with them or anything. I just bought a huge box of it a couple of years ago and I'm, I'm still using it. <laughs> yeah, all right, and then I might want to just kind of line this up. I could make them go opposite each other or have them go the same way. I kind of like that. This pattern paper is retired from Stampin' Up, but I thought it was really, really cute. All right, I'm going to put him down there. I will tell you that the um, the watercolor paper does not like to accept the adhesive that that well. See, it didn't want to stick there. So, you know, that's that's one of the drawbacks. I think it's a texture or maybe the sizing in it. So you have to kind of press hard to get the, to get it to grab. And I put some on the card base as well because I run into issues with that. 
kind of like trying to stick fabric. And I'm going to put him there. And then I want to figure out what I want to use for a tag. I could use one of these thank yous, but I really think this is a great uh, happy birthday type of um, type of thing. So I'm just going to put that up there with a little bit of foam squares just to give it a little bit of a dimension. There we go. And then, oh, I can't wait to show you my envelope trick. Oh my gosh, you're going to have to stick around for that. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to stick that right up there in that corner. And see, it coordinates perfectly because you did it from the scraps. And then if you want to do um, a little more decorating, something I really like is eyelets. Uh, you might have some from scrapbooking years ago. I just think they're a wonderful little embellishment. And I also think this is like... But the best thing since sliced bread, this is a crocodile, and I love this for quietly setting eyelets because when I first started scrapbooking and we would do eyelets because they were like the most popular thing, you had to bang them with a hammer so you couldn't create if you're because like I have I had three you know little infants when when I was scrapbooking when I first started scrapbooking and it's like well I can't use that when they're napping and that's pretty much when I when I had any creative time because I'd be banging with a hammer and waking them up so um so when this thing came along I knew that I had to have it and I've had this for years and it lasts really long I had the big one too I still do but I don't use it nearly as much as this smaller cheaper one so just to uh to let you know there and just that's really all you need for a little embellishment on that card so as promised, I'm going to show you how to make an envelope to match any card. And this will work no matter what size card you have. It doesn't work quite as well on long skinny cards. So if you had like a card that was like 3 inches by 10 inches, it's not going to work that great because you're going to end up with um, with like really long flaps. You need to trim them down. But that's it. I mean, you can still do it. You just need to trim it down. So what you need to do is measure corner to corner on your card. So I'm just going to grab my ruler which has seen better days that the seven is pretty much rubbed off but we're gonna just we're gonna measure corner to corner that's roughly and you don't need to be precise it's roughly eight inches okay roughly eight inches um, and the centimeters are completely rubbed off so I can't tell you what that would be in centimeters but it's roughly eight inches so I want to take that measurement and add one inch so that would be nine inches and then I want to cut a piece of paper that size square and so that's what I have here I have a nine by nine piece of pattern paper okay and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see my messy table and then what we're gonna do is you're gonna turn your paper so it is like a diamond so if you're looking at it, it looks like a diamond and you're gonna set your card um, kind of centered up in there okay so your card is square towards you and then you've got a diamond underneath it okay and then um, and if you want your pattern on the inside like I do so when I write an address it's going to be on the outside on a plain side um, you want the side you want to be the inside facing up so if you want your pattern on the outside you want the pattern facing out in the white of the paper inside does that make sense okay then you're just going to fold your flaps around you're going to fold the corner that way then you're just going to fold this corner this way. Now this works good for a flat card. If your card was dimensional, then you would probably want to maybe just kind of slide it over a little bit before you fold it. Give yourself an extra, you know, eighth of an inch or um, whatnot. But this works really well for a fairly flat card. Okay, so if I was, if I had like a really dimensional card here, what I would do is I'd fold this one, then I'd scooch it out a little bit, then I'd fold the other one just to give me a little bit more wiggle room in there, but I don't really need to for this. And then what I'm going to do is grab my scissors, and I am going to cut these corners out here. That's going to make it easier to insert your envelope. You don't really need to do this, but it makes it easier, so I do it, and I think it looks a little nicer. So, see, I mean, not even cutting it great, I'm just cutting those notches out. And then what you're going to do is crease it because you're going to have a really loose um, score fold scoring line. I'm going to put your adhesive down and I like this adhesive. And just crease that down so it's nice and flat. You could use a quarter rounder on this if you want to. And then watch. It's going to slide in perfectly and it fits no matter what size envelope you do. That's how I did all of the other envelopes and it just works perfectly every single time. Uh, and there you can see how like this is that same stamp done just like three different versions of him peeking out looks a little different each time. That actually be kind of cute to do like a like a flip book or something I think. Um, but the envelopes for this done the exact same way. Uh, all these envelopes were done the same way and then I didn't even need to have a template and um, 
and I just love that. And you can take a look at some of these other cards here because they were so much fun. If you want to find these stamps I used, check out our sponsor, TopFlightStamps.com. Use the coupon code TheFrugalCrafter10 to save 10% on your order. And USA orders over $50 ship free. So it's a great deal there. I'll link up all of this stuff in the, in the uh, video description so you can find all the products I used. Or you can just kind of see what I used and then make do with what you have at home because you should always try what you own first before you go buy new because um, that gives you more ideas to use the supplies you already have and I love that. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this tutorial, please give me a thumbs up. Until next time, happy crafting!